So we're happy to be here. Um, we're hoping that this will be a little different than a usual training with you guys. We actually want this to be kind of collaborative. We know that a lot of the people at Kalos have a lot of experience um, to share with us. We're still learning exactly what are the best ways to use this product in the field. Uh, and so we want you to get your hands on the app, we want you to get your hands on the hardware and talk to us about how this would be useful, what problems you can envision solving with this. We want to hear feedback, you know, after we're gone, I know Brian's uh, got three systems already and we want to hear how you're using them. And uh, hopefully this is, this is a, a two-way street where we're learning as much from you are, as we are teaching you, so. I would say in y'all's climate, uh, I'm sure y'all come across every now and then an air handler in specific times of the year where that coal's really making a lot of water. There's a lot of sweat, right? Um, and it's problematic. And then as technicians, as we grow understanding of airflow and superheat and subcool and all of that, we can sometimes mitigate some of these problems in certain situations. But airflow, is, it's a challenging one to understand. Total external static, can work. Um, it is a pressure measurement, not a flow measurement, right? We use it to correlate to flow through a, through a chart, but sometimes that could be misleading. If the indoor coal gets dirty, the blower gets dirty, right? It's gonna mislead us and it's not gonna be truthful. So as technicians and we're understanding airflow more and more and more, what we're trying to explain is this tool's gonna like get you over that hurdle to where you feel 100% confident to where you can now talk to the homeowner about that problem with pure confidence. And it's no longer like I'm 99%. We want you like 110% to where you can say, I know this and now I've, I'm backed up by something. And there's a report you can give them. And that's really the idea is like, we want to raise the bar in the industry about airflow and make it important. Commissioning has always been something that gets pushed to the wayside, right? But it's probably one of the most important things we should be doing and it's hard to get to it, right? It's at the end of the day, you're beat down, tired, and the last thing you wanna do is dial the system in. But we dial that system in, callbacks being reduced. It's a Ooh. good tool for system <clears throat> checks to leave that place with a clean slate, thumbs up, homeowner's happy, they have a copy, you have a copy. Our bases are covered, right? And that's what we're going for. Raise the elevation of airflow knowledge in the trade. So I want to start, I know I've heard Brian talk about this, but I want to ask you guys, why does airflow matter with an air conditioning system? It is the driving force for any vehicle. <clears throat> what do you mean by it's the driving force? Without proper airflow, you're not going to get proper measurements in any part of the system. Whatsoever. So you're not going to get any, including what are the ones that... You're not going to get refrigerant, um, reading, you're not going to get... And you, you, you're not going to get the correct charge if you don't have the correct airflow, yeah. right? The superheat and subcool are affected by airflow. What yeah. else? Homeowner comfort. Comfort? Tell me what you mean by that. Um, without, if, you, if the airflow is too low, it's not moving the heating and cooling as efficient as efficiently. If it's too high, it can be uncomfortable. So we're, we're getting to, into two different things. If it's too high and if it's too low, and you mentioned two things, comfort and efficiency. Let's try and put those together. If the airflow is too low, what does that do to our efficiency? Anybody know? Good What's that? Good yeah, good okay, so if it's too low, you get or better with three Ts. Okay, does anybody know what happens to efficiency if airflow is too low? Yep, it gets worse. So quickly, because we've talked about a lot of this lately, what happens, why does efficiency go down when airflow goes down? I just want to tie these ideas together. What happens to your evaporator coil when the airflow over the evaporator coil, because we're specifically talking indoor airflow, what happens inside that evaporator coil? It's colder. It's colder. There's less heat being absorbed into it, right? And so it gets colder. And what does that do to the pressure in the evaporator coil? drops the pressure on the evaporator coil, right? Which, what does that do to the weight or density of the refrigerant returning to the compressor? Decreases. What's that? Decreases. Decreases it, right? Pressure is less, that makes the return gas lighter. When the return gas is lighter, what does that do to the compressor? 
Well, the compressor can run hotter, but also you're not moving as much refrigerant. So every stroke or oscillation of that compressor, less refrigerant's moving. And when you're moving less refrigerant, what does that do to your efficiency? Decreases. Decreases it. So I just want you to think all the way down the line of why that's decreasing efficiency. Because the air gets colder coming out of the top when we have low airflow, right? We get colder air coming out of the top because the air moving over that coil is moving slower and that evaporative coil is colder, right? So sometimes we think, well, colder air, that means better efficiency, right? But it's less air, colder air, lower evaporator temperature, lower suction gas pressure, lighter suction gas equals moving less refrigerant, which means less efficiency. And Keep so going. what happens to capacity? So this is re very much related to efficiency. Down. Goes down, right? Their flow is too high. Less, less yep. Higher suction pressure. Yep. Noisy duct work. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> duct noise. What about efficiency? Decreases. Huh? Decreases. Nope. Efficiency is great. In fact, if you're in a dry climate, if oh, you're in yeah, Arizona, yeah, 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 yeah. you want to run 500 CFM per ton. <laughs> okay. It is actually an interesting, there's an interesting thing that happens here though in our climate, which is that there's a point at which you run airflow so high that your, uh, that even your uh, capacity crashes. Yeah. Because total capacity is a combination of which two types of, of cooling? Latent. Latent and sensible, right? So when you hit the point that your evaporator coil is near or above dew point, so now you no longer are doing any latent cooling, your system capacity will actually crash in terms of overall system capacity. In a market like Arizona, where you have no chance at dehumidifying anyway because the air is so dry and the dew points are so high, I mean, so low, yeah, so low. In that case, you run the airflow up intentionally because all you're really gonna do is sensible and that's all you wanna do anyway, right? You don't wanna further dehumidify the air when it's already dry. But in our market, Getting that coil to the right temperature is what optimizes our capacity, our efficiency, and dehumidification. Keep going. So what happens to capacity if airflow is too high? Oh, it increases. Yep, Incre so capacity Sensible goes up. capacity increases, yep. We thought about this one, but duct noise can be a big problem. Uh, our friend Ed Johnawak always talks about when you have to turn the TV up when the air conditioner comes on. These are really good answers. Any other uh, answers to why we care about airflow? What's that? It's a big component. Yeah. If you're only looking at the refrigerant side, you're only looking at half the system. It's the other half. Yeah, they call it air conditioning for a reason. There's one more thing we're not thinking about in terms of uh, customer comfort, though, with airflow. So we've talked about if it's, if it's not low enough, you won't dehumidify, right? So we need to get the right amount. We don't want it to be too high. But what happens if it is too low to customer comfort? Is there increased customer comfort? You can't feel the fan in here. It's, it's the circulation, right? So you're not gonna get proper air mixing. If you have a system that's designed for a particular airflow, you're not gonna get proper air mixing if you don't have proper uh, discharge velocity. The condensation, that's another one too. Yeah, that's another really big one. Uh, undesigned condensation. So condensation, sweating ducts, sweating yep. equipment, all of that if airflow is too low. Yeah, so your, your duct temperature can actually get colder than you want it. Now you got water condensing where you don't want it and you got mold. So I'll ask a question. Can you set the superheat and subcooling on a system in this climate at 450 CFMs per ton? Oh yeah, you can. You can set it, right? You could set it. So you can set the charge with an improper airflow. But let's say that house needs 350 CFMs per ton. What should come first, setting the airflow or setting the charge? ABC, airflow before charge, right? Airflow, right? ABC. Airflow then set the charge. That way, you're trying to achieve the right dehumidification in it all. How do we measure airflow? That's what we're trying to find out. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Before we showed up, how did you measure airflow? You call Max. Yeah, you call Max. So we're gonna get your hands on stuff now. That's a perfect intro. This is what the app looks like, right? We'll okay. open the app. When you open the app, these are the four workflows that are available. I'll just kind of generally talk to all you guys about what the workflows are. <clears throat> so the first workflow, system airflow and static pressures. As an AC technician, I would say that's the workflow you're looking for because you're gonna get 
system airflow in the diagnostic screen, and you're gonna get pressures in the diagnostic screen, and you're gonna get a breakdown to show you where the problems could be. Yeah. Now the unit is set up with a problem, right? So when okay. we get to the diagnostic screen, it's gonna, we're gonna hit the detail screen and say, oh, what's going on here? Interesting. So the second workflow is system airflow. It's like a quick in and out, right? Let's just say somebody just wants system airflow mm -hmm. and they don't want the pressures. That's a very fast workflow. You won't get the pressure screens, right? Or the breakdown. You have the ResNet 310 standard workflow. That's for your HERS raters and people who are grading homes. What they're gonna do is enter a target airflow. Let's say you did manual JDNS on a house, right? And you've designed it and you have a target where you wanna reach and the house is gonna get graded for that. Uh, oh. standard 310. During that workflow, you would enter your target airflow, run the test, and then the test is going to grade itself. The grading platform for uh, ResNet 310 and ACA 310 is in there, right? And it's going to tell you if you pass or fail, basically. Or Fancy. You graded one, two, or three. And then there's a pressure gauge if you just want to take pressure reading, record it. Duct pressure? <laughs> right. Static pressure? So we're going to do system airflow static pressure. Okay. Now, you'll have Oh, see, we got Steve devices over there. So Turn we have Steve, he's firing up his DG8 and his TrueFlow grid. I'm not sure which two he's connected to, so we need to connect to R2. Right? Okay. Normally you're not going to see this in the field because you're not going to have two. Right, you're going to have one on your truck. So you'll see there's a model number, DG8507. Nice. Right? So that you know that's the one you want to connect to, so hit the plus. The Bluetooth's like proprietary to TEC, so you don't have to go in settings and find it. You open up the tool, you hit plus, it syncs up automatically. What's the Bluetooth range on this, Chris? Uh, it varies, right? Because okay. you could deal with, com uh, depends on what type of building you're in. Yeah. Well, we've had guys that went all the way across the house, two-story houses, and it works, but uh, it's good. You know, Bluetooth is a variable entity. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So Compare. we've got TrueFlow Grid 112. So let's hit the plus there. Okay. Okay, we're connected to the two devices. Now on this screen, it's telling you two big buttons, right? Is it a furnace? Is it an air handler? Which we have an air handler. So you just, yes. anywhere on that screen, bam. Upflow, horizontal, downflow. Oh, sorry. No, you're good, you're good. No, that, that's what, oh. We don't have a downflow. You're right. Sorry, it's my first day. <laughs> that's how easy it is, folks. So cooling capacity, this is a two ton on the condenser, right? Condenser capacity is two tons, so click the two. Do we do that in BTUs or do we just? No, just two. Just two. Just two. Okay, easy. Yep. Air filter location. So this is a little tricky because it's a test model unit. Mm -hmm. Normally this would have ductwork coming off of it, right? So yeah. being it doesn't, we're gonna treat it as a uh, filter grill. Okay. So what if you have certain systems like that sitting in closets that have a you know, return grill in the door, but there's no actual ductwork because it's just centered in the middle of the house? You would do filter in slot because there will be there would be a little bit of pressure mm -hmm. inside that chase. It ain't much of a chase. It's just a box, right? Yep. But there's a grill and grill is a resistance. So you're going to have a little bit of pressure there okay. and you want to count for that. So you go filter in slot. Gotcha. So cooling climate, right? humid. Humid climate, so 350, and then click next. There you go. So that's test instructions. You'll have some systems, depending on the climate zone, where they may have uh, some air that's going through a different system, uh, a humidifier maybe, mm -hmm. pipe, uh, as a bypass loop, right? You'd want to valve that out so there's no bypass airflow running the test. So we don't have that, so click continue. Okay. This screen gets you started, right? It gives you a picture of the install and it shows you exactly where to put that probe. I'll let you see the workflow. I'll place the probe for you okay. so you know what's going on. So we're gonna put that in between the filter and the coil, right? So okay. we've placed our static pressure probe. We've got a reading. We'll click take measurement. So every second it takes 20 readings. It's a five second average. So we get a hundred readings and then we average those readings, okay? And now it went from return duct to supply duct. So it's telling, it's prompting us to take the static pressure out, static pressure probe out and install it in the supply plenum. Now, if you had two of these test tubes, could what? you just pull the hose off the manometer and, get, and yeah, plug or just like, or just, yeah, just have one in the return, one in the supply, or do you have to do it each? You one have at to time? move it. Click take measurement. Okay. 
right? There we go, we're taking our average again. Okay, so we've captured the readings in normal system operation with the filter, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we wanna know is we wanna know the flow of this system right now with the filter in it, okay? That's what we're gonna get later. So we got one more step, we'll click continue. It tells us, take the filter out, put the digital true flow grid in place of it. Ooh, okay. scandalous. I always rip those when out. I take them out. <laughs> I don't yeah, know how so I just did that. You'll notice it says the air in right there, so it tells you. Oh, but here's, let me show you something. Mm -hmm. Don't click take measurement yet. Watch what happens when I put it in upside down. Okay. So let's say we're in a rush and we're like, you know what, I'm just toss this thing in and get the flow. So when the airflow is blowing backwards, it'll tell you, check, check true flow plate orientation. Nice. So you can't miss the mark, right? And even if you click take measurement, it won't give you a measurement. It'll just default to that screen. Awesome. So that's a preventative measure. Okay, so remember, the idea here is to not let any air take a bypass loop. We want all the air moving through the grid. So now that the grid's in place, we're gonna take measurement. We're gonna take all those readings. Now, what's happened is we're reading all the airflow across that grid. We're taking like a traverse mm -hmm. right, measurement right there with a new static pressure with the grid in place. So there's our airflow, 563 CFM. Yay, that's, now, that's cool. That's the CFM with the filter in, not mm -hmm. with the grid in currently, right? There's a correction factor that's happening in the app that's saying if this was the static pressure with the filter in, this was the static pressure with the grid in, and here's the flow with the grid, Here's the back end data coming at you to say, here was the flow when the filter was in, right? It's a lot of math going on on the back end. So if you click continue, you can save it internally into your phone or tablet. And there's our diagnostic screen. From that diagnostic screen, we can see airflow. We can see it's in the yellow, right? And this is to be built as like training wheels, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's start with new system. Okay. You've installed a new system. Your ductwork may be okay. And this may be a guide to say, hey, well, I need to increase the fan speed on the mm -hmm. unit. Or, God forbid this happens, but let's say you do a system install, somebody maybe didn't do a good job on the manual D JDS, right? Or the manual D section of the job, and the duct design was, was not good. And you got high supply static. Every install. Uh, right, not, not, <laughs> not our installs, right? Uh, so we go check somebody's install, you'll see that the supply static pressure is 0.8, which is crazy high, right? So our total external static is gonna say like, woo, right? You need bigger duct. Right, so we need to relieve some pressure. So we can see it broken down here, supply plenum pressure, right? 0.7, that's mm -hmm. aggressive, that's an aggressive, you know? It's two things you kinda gotta think about. This is why we built the chart where you have two main graphs, airflow, external static pressure, right? Those mean a lot to us as technicians. But if we had built those margins too tight and we were always in the red, then homeowners would be mad at us when we started giving these reports, right? So we had to play all brands, right? So think of it as like training wheels. So we opened the bands up a little bit mm -hmm. to give you some rules to say, hey, depending on your unit, you're okay. But if you look down here, these are recommendations, right? To where it's like, hey, under a typical install situation where supply static pressure should be 0.1, maybe 0.2, you're at 0.7. You're way out the box on what normal should be. We don't want to tell the homeowner like, oh my God, it failed because it's a rough conversation, mm -hmm. right? It's like, how do you go to a homeowner and say, your duct works really bad? Right? After the fact. But yeah. yet, the system's been installed for two years. And let's mm -hmm. just say the climate wasn't right and, they did, and it didn't cause sweat issues. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you're there on year three, not your install. And then you're thinking to yourself, man, I have this. This is really bad. And let's say you didn't have this. How do you have that conversation with just external static pressure measurements? You're going to be like, man, your duct works really bad. And what's that homeowner going to think? Who sales are you? guy. Yeah, sales <laughs> guy. You're telling me my system's been here for three years and all of a sudden I have bad ductwork problems? Get yeah, out of here, right? All the vents open in the house. This is just a nice way to say it. it's not just me. Mm -hmm. You know, a manufacturer who constantly studies airflow and puts all their effort to airflow knowledge is also standing with me and giving me this report that I can give to you to say, you have bad ductwork problems, right? Like here's a obvious mm -hmm. reason that we gotta do something. 
And then it, you know, it gives you the encouragement to maybe say, if we fix this, you won't have the chance of that happening to you, right? Of systems sweating out of control because it's in a hot human attic. In this situation, we have a busted duct system, right? Mm -hmm. The supply plenum's got a lot of pressure drop. If you click the detail screen right here, it will tell you, you have low flow and you have high supply pressure, right? And it'll give you some recommendations of what to look for and what to attack. So you can debrief yourself before you go have that conversation with the homeowner. Mm -hmm. That way, not only do you know there's a problem and now you're confident, now you can kind of get into executing some of the solution-based conversation. You might've been 99% confident, but maybe now you're 110% confident. Cause it's like, hey, we're TEC, we're standing with you. Like yeah. we put enough faith in that tool to where we're we're telling you and we're standing right, like we're in the house with you. We're standing with you and saying, Make a video right here and saying that so yeah. you can play it for the homeowner. Chris is standing right here with you. <laughs> yeah. We'll just crop me and put me yep. right in there and say, I'm, I'm with you, man. It's good, it's good for business. <laughs> Let's say the homeowner wants a copy, okay? We can go down here to the PDF button right here, click that, we can enter the customer's information. We can also take pictures of the equipment. Let's say the supply um, pressure is really bad and we can see why, crushed ductwork. Mm -hmm. right? We could capture that picture, save it in that format. So when we generate a report, at the end, there's the report where you're going to have all the customer's information. You can put the company logo here, right? Your breakdowns are there. All your pictures are there. It's put your pictures for customer. Customers understand words. Right. Show picture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Easily understand. I think technicians and I think homeowners are going to focus on those graphs. Yeah, that's all. Right. That's where it's going to be. And then as you get more used to this program, what I see happening is techs are going to start looking at the numbers more and the graphs and start thinking, well, this gave me bad numbers at point four. This gave me bad numbers at point five. And then what we're trying to do is slowly train you to say, hey, supply static pressure is best at this range. Return static pressure is best at this range, right? Just to kind of give you like a better understanding of what the static pressures should be throughout the whole system. All right, who wants to rip and run? All right, so we're gonna close that. We go back, we can just hit measure. It goes right back to the screen, we can do it again. How can we spice this up a little differently? Well, it's a super complicated application, so yeah. that alone is gonna throw you for loop. Let's open the pressure up. Let's see what we're getting, let's see. I think there's a damper on top too. You could open all the way up as well if you want to. Yeah. I'm thinking I want to get you somewhere 0.4. Prepping it just so I can kind of determine what the results are going to be. So you have two ports coming out of your probe here. Yes. What's you the other talk? one for? Okay. Give me one second. Let me see if this is where I think it's going to be. Yeah, it's good. You also don't have the filter in right now, by the way. You still have that. Oh, you're right. So for this, obviously, you have to have multiple frames. We do. We have seven frames and a uh, custom built frame, and we're making more frames for if somebody one of specific frames. Gotcha. Now let's say you were to have a lot larger one of these. Does this plate that goes in here, do you have different sizes of this or is it just different no, the frames? the plate's the same. Okay. The plate can move up to, um, it can calculate up to 2000 CFMs. Okay, so if you were to have like an 18 by 30, you still use the same plate? You can take the cut to fit adapter plate and make an 18 by 30 out of it. Every now and again, I see them, right? Like yeah. just the oddball. Here's what I'll tell you. If you come across a situation where the adapter plate is not in your kit mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily have to have an adapter plate, you could put in a kit that fits yeah. three sides and blank off the right side. Yeah. The idea is just you got to move all the total system airflow through the plate. So you may have a situation where you're like, oh man, I don't have the right adapter plate. But if you're creative and you have like a piece of cardboard or some masking, yeah. you know, pop it off, get the flow, done. Okay. It also works in double return situations. There's, I made some videos on hvacairflow.com that shows how to use this if you have two main returns, right? And mm -hmm. what happens is that's soon to go into the workflow to where I'll show you how to do it. But before we got there, I made a video on how to show people because it's brand new and we were people were asking. Yeah. So right now what we're doing is we're putting the true flow grid in one at the point where it says put the grid in. When you do that, you blank off the other grill. That way you move all the system airflow through the grid and it's giving you the flow with the double filter return. So you can do it in a double filter rotation. 
Interesting. And if you had that wouldn't say, restrict airflow at all, though, having one of those completely blanked off. The correction factor picks it up. Really? So, so it's just tape. built into the system and the programming of it. Right. That, okay. The correction factor. So, so here's a here's something really important. We're not taking total external static pressure like a blower chart's being used, right? We're not using the correct, we're not using the static pressure for that reason. We're strictly using it for the correction factor, right? Yeah. Whatever it is here, what is, what's it here with the plate? And that just makes our shift, right? Mm -hmm. It's just an equation. While total external static pressure or ex external static pressure and fan table, they're using those measurements to correlate to the blower chart. Total separate game being played. It's like a math problem, word problem where they go, if train takes point A to point B, it takes six hours. How yeah. fast is it going yeah. over this many miles? It's just the same math equation, right? right? The difference is we're actually measuring the airflow. Yeah. While when you're just taking pressures and then correlating to a fan chart, you're just you're just transferring pressure to yeah. flow, but you're not actually measuring it. And here's where that's gonna fail. If you're in a situation where this indoor coal is dirty and you try to do external static pressure and go to the chart, it's gonna fail you big time, right? And the more dirty the coal is, the more caked up the blower is, the more you're gonna fail. And here's the weird part about that. It's not gonna fail you a little bit because when the internal compart components get dirty, the pressures are gonna go down, right? And when you go to the fan table and the pressures go down, it's gonna say you're moving more airflow. So when you think you're going to just be off a little bit, you're actually going the opposite direction. You're going to be off a lot. So it wouldn't read a coil like that? What's that? So it wouldn't would read with a coil? A good no, it wouldn't, that wouldn't, oh, it wouldn't work about, with that? You're talking about the true flow? Yeah. The true flow will tell you the flow no matter what's dirty. But you wouldn't want to do external static pressure tests with yeah. that coil because it's going to fail you. But that's, that's the idea. This is going to give you accuracy no matter if it's dirty or clean, works for both. There's good methods out there. You just gotta know when to deploy that method. Sounds like a lot of training wheels for airflow. A lot of training wheels, right? Where, you, know, you get the, the diagnostic screen and the more you look at it, the more you're gonna train your brain to start thinking, you know, this is good, that's bad. And even if one day you don't have the program with you, mm -hmm. you, pick, you pick out your manometer and you go bam, and you're training yourself to go, I know that's bad because when I had my true flow on a job like this, it told me that was bad. Right? And you're gonna start remembering those numbers and get more comfortable with static pressures and what should be normal through the duct system. System airflow, static pressure. Starting there, we have an air handler. Air handler. Electric heat with a upflow application. And then... Cooling capacity. That's just asking for the tonnage of the system. System is a... Well, on the condenser, it's uh, condenser it over capacity. There? It's a two ton. Two ton. And then air filter location, we're doing the filter grill for we an application. We are because we don't have any return duct work on this one. Okay. If we did, we'd call it a filter slot, right? Because we're not going to have any pressure resistance below that filter, mm -hmm. right? Filter grill. Okay. And then cooling climate, we have a humid climate here. Right. You can feel it in the air. Close any humidification dampers. Set the equipment to cooling mode at a high speed temperature. So we're good to go. Just press we're, continue. We're good to go. And then it's asking for our return, talk, return duct static. Right. Then I should be able to come here and that connects straight to that. And you said it measures for five seconds and it's 20 so, measurements right. per second. We're doing 20 uh, measurements per second for five seconds. Unless you're in the ResNet ACA 310 standard, mm -hmm. then you're doing 10 second averaging because okay. that's their rules for the standard 310. So you'll do 10 seconds in their category. And we move up to the supply. <sighs> Pick the short guy to do this one. Okay, so we got those two measurements. We mm -hmm. can take a retake if we feel like we fumbled something. Okay. Like we could pick one, retake, and start over, but we're good. So continue. Does it matter which way those are pointed? Yes. So we'll take a tiny pause on this. You have a static pressure probe, okay? And what that's reading is static pressure. So like if you blew up a balloon, there's pressure in the balloon, right? You don't have any much flow or no flow. It's just ambient pressure. And that's what this tube is doing. When we point the tip in the direction of airflow, the holes are out to the side and we're getting 
ambient static pressure. I don't know if ambient is the right word, but I just made it up and it sounds good. So if we wanted, what we don't want is velocity pressure okay, in, a, in this reading. What we don't want to do is turn it to where the airflow can hit the holes. So now we're going to get static pressure and velocity pressure combined. So it's, it's going to make us look like we have more static pressure than we want to. You want to so, so every time we're doing static pressure readings, we always want it in the direction of flow. That way the air flow is not hitting the holes. We're going to swap out the filter mm -hmm. for the digital true flow grid and then take a measurement. So at this point, we want to rip that filter out. So now you got them swapped out. You can take measurement and there's your flow, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see it and it'll let you look at it before you go to continue and get to that diagnostic screen. Cause you feel like something's maybe just not right. Like maybe you just hadn't have it in there all the way or something like that. You did fine. So let's click continue. So there's our diagnostics, right? Our airflow, we're moving 344 CFMs per ton. So like ideally perfection, right? We're moving the right amount of CFMs per ton for this climate. Total external static pressure, 0.56. You know, this is a dynamite install right here. Like mm -hmm. this is this is right there close to where we want to be. Shout out to the install crew. That's right. But we can also see where our pressure drops are. Mm -hmm. Now, if we wanted to internally look at ourselves and say, man, what could we have done better on that job if we wanted to take it to the next level? This is where we could look at supply plenum pressure and say, well, we're at 0.34. We could have brought it down a little bit. That would have brought external static pressure down a little bit, which we have room to stay in the green there. Yeah, there's right? a lot of, so we a lot of could, play. We could take it down a little bit if we wanted to. It doesn't mean we're busted. Mm -hmm. We're good. It's like if maybe if we wanted to get a little bit more efficient, we could, right? Think of it as like an efficiency scale at this point. We I thought of myself. We can get into that in the detail screen. Okay. Right? About what we could do. So flow is okay, high hit pressure. Yep. We can go back. Of course, we can hit the PDF button. We can enter our customer's information like we did before, generate the report, mm -hmm. take pictures if we want. Now, let's say you're in and out and you're ready to like psh, move on to the next job. Five o'clock. Five o'clock, ready to roll. You forgot to send this to the main office. Mm -hmm. Or the homeowner calls and is like, hey, I want to I want to copy that report. Maybe you sent it to the office, but we forgot to send it to the homeowner. You can go back into saved, right? If, and you have your copy. Test three right, right you there. You can go to test three. You can then go back to your diagnostic screen, generate the report, and send it out later gotcha. if you want to. So you don't necessarily have to do it right So if you forget about paperwork, like some people, I'm not going to say any names, myself. <laughs> now there's a right, way to always right. catch up on it. Yeah, that's a nice feature that I like. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.